Hi, this is Bob Wells here, and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. This is the show where we hear about people's interests and uncover some fascinating stories at the same time. I hope you enjoy today's show. Over the last few years, the terms equality, diversity and inclusivity, EDI, have become more familiar in our everyday language, and particularly so in our working life. But what do these terms actually mean? Well, here to answer those questions, I'm joined by Toby Milden. Toby is an equity, diversity and inclusion architect and the founder of Milden, a consultancy that has delivered programmes to companies such as Sony, HarperCollins, Centrica and also the NHS. Hello and welcome to Undercurrent Stories, Toby. Hey, Bob. Thanks for inviting me along. Before we talk about your work with Milden, could you just tell us a bit about your journey, your life's journey, and how you became involved with um, equity, diversity and inclusion, please? Yes, I I fell into doing EDI professionally when I was working for the BBC. Yeah. I actually have had a background in technology. Um, So when I left university, I was an IT consultant for Accenture. Um, I worked. I then went to work in healthcare technology, uh, and then I ended up at the BBC working uh, as a project manager. I used to work really closely with the, the leadership team of the design and engineering department, and they were concerned at the time about the gender imbalance that we had in tech compared to the rest of the BBC, where there was a bit more of a, an even gender split. So um, to cut a long story short, they, they needed a project manager to execute a plan that they had come up with to uh, attract and recruit and retain more women in technology and engineering roles. So it started off as a secondment for a day a week. uh, And then I quickly realized that this was actually a full-time job. And uh, it, yeah, it became a full-time position. Um, But running alongside that, I've got my own personal lived experience of inclusion and exclusion. So I was born with a rare neuromuscular disability. I've been a wheelchair user since I was a toddler. Um, I now require 24-hour care. And I have faced my own challenges in getting into the workplace and getting ahead in, in the workplace. So I can bring a lot of that lived experience to the work as well. Um, And then when I was working at the BBC, I used to also run the Disabled Staff Forum. And this was a a thing that I did on the side of my desk. And we were a network of disabled employees. And our our role was to to really represent the voices of disabled people working in the the corporation. A grounding in in sort of the beginning of how you decided to found your, your company, Milden. Yeah, so I, I, I pivoted my career at the BBC and I, I took on an EDI role as a full-time job. Um, I, I then, uh, that, that enabled me to take on other BBC departments, not just technology, but I used to look after radio and all of the corporate services. And then I'd been at the BBC for 10 years and I wanted to get back into the corporate sector. So I went to go and work for Deloitte, where Deloitte, the accountancy firm, had much more of a focus on changing culture, what they call a a culture of respect and inclusion. Um, And then five years ago, I decided that I wanted to set up my own business. I wanted the the freedom to work with multiple organizations because I felt like I I could make a bigger impact that way. I wanted the freedom to do creative projects like write my books and start up my own podcast. And I, I just needed to do that under my own company. And you've never looked back? No, I, I love working for myself. I, I love running my own business. Um, yeah. I've managed to build up a small team over the last five years as well. So it's not just me working on my own anymore. And uh, we're, we're, we're slowly growing and doing lots of interesting things. Yeah, I, I think it would be helpful for listeners. I mean, we, we all know a bit about e- what equity means and diversity and inclusion, but but would it be okay if you just sort of gave us a bit of a, a background and, and a foundation in terms of what those what those actually mean please yes yeah, certainly because these are terms that are used a lot in the business world today and i i think most people that i talk to have a good understanding of what they mean but sometimes we have different understandings um first of all let, let's talk about diversity because diversity is actually the the outcome that you get by doing a lot of the hard work and what there's a few myths I want to dispel about diversity. 
um, first of all, we are all diverse. I think a lot of people in business think that diversity is about those individuals over there. Um, not everyone identifies as being diverse because quite often when people think of diversity, they might think about very limited characteristics. So they might think about uh, gender or they might think about uh, women in leadership positions or, or women in technology roles. Like like I, I started off um, you know, at the BBC focusing on, on one particular um, aspect or they might think it's about race and ethnicity. But the thing is that we are all diverse. We are all different. And it's our differences and our uniqueness that actually contribute to the richness of life. And an analogy, an analogy that I often use with my clients is, is that of the iceberg, where you can see 10% of the iceberg poking above the waterline. And these could be our visible characteristics. So if you were to meet me in person, you would see that I present as male. Um, I... Uh, I'm white, uh, I have a physical disability, or I'm a wheelchair user. But actually, there's so much beneath the waterline, the 80% of the iceberg that you can't see are, are, are less visible characteristics. And in my instance, I'm also a gay man. And that's not necessarily obvious when you when you meet me, it's one of those invisible characteristics that I have. Um, but I'm also introverted, rather than extroverted. I also grew up in the countryside rather than the city, um, and that influenced my outlook on life um, and my, yeah, my 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 culture. So, I suppose the main point that I'm trying to get across here is that that we are all diverse. That diversity is something that applies to to all of us. Yes. Um, now, the question or not, this is where we move on to inclusion: is whether you feel like you are included in the workplace that you work in, whether you have that sense of belonging that you feel part of the workplace family or not. Um, so, and the thing is you can have diversity and everyone feels included, uh, and sorry, you can have diversity, but low levels of inclusion, yeah. um, or you can have a, a low level of diversity, but a high level of inclusion. The, the thing, you know, they, they go hand in hand. With inclusion, I know we, we talk about it in the corporate environment, but but I guess it's it's the right thing to do anyway, isn't it? You know, I mean, by having a, a diverse number of people working in an organisation who feel included, it, it's right for the business with positive it with is, positive that, outcomes. Definitely, I mean that that's definitely one of the the reasons why companies invest in inclusion. They they think it, it, it's just there's a moral case to it. It's the it's the right thing to do. Uh, I talk to many senior leaders who say, this is a no-brainer. We're doing it anyway because it's the right thing to do, regardless yes. of all of the other, I would say, more harder reasons why that's been evidenced through the likes of McKinsey and, that, and the academic world. Um, so, yeah, you, you're right. I mean, there are definitely business leaders who say we should be doing this because it's the right thing to do. Yes, I mean, I've got I've got a story of my own. I I ran a um, a timber business, um, so this would be in the mid well in the nineteen nineties, and um, mm. I got approached by a uh, the local government agency asking if I would consider um, employing a guy who had had severe mental health issues, so much so that he was unable to work, um, and they said how how they would do it is that they would put him in. I'd, I'd have him for sort of. You know, every Monday and Tuesday for two hours. Um, and he he came in, um, one of his roles, well, his main role was on the back of a saw. So the, you know, the timber would go through the machine and he'd take it off the other end. Um, and I was a little bit, not so much reluctant, but I thought, well, I'm not sure about this. It might have been health and safety, I don't know, or unconscious bias. But anyway, I, I took him on um, and he actually turned out to be one of, one of my best employees. We gradually built his hours up. Yeah. Um, so he started working every day for three hours till he got, you know, he was working as a full-time employee and you could, everybody used to say that they could set, set their watch by what time he came in, what time he left. It was absolutely fantastic. So from my own career, um, it, it's just a story I wanted to share of, of some success. And I, I really like that story because what that told me is that you, uh, 
in that moment, I think you were a very inclusive manager in that you you went beyond that fear that you had because I do talk to a lot of senior leaders in businesses that are held back by fear. Yeah. They're, they're worried about saying the wrong thing. They're worried about causing offense to somebody or embarrassment or and, and, and their psychological response is to retract rather than lean into that awkwardness. Be, be vulnerable as a leader to say, you know what? I'm anxious about this. I don't have all the answers. Uh, I'm, I'm worried about X, Y, Z happening. Um, but you know what? We're going to go for it anyway. Yeah, we're yeah. going to get out. We're going to move beyond our comfort zone, and yeah, and, uh, yeah, and we're going to give it a go. Yeah, and and I think a lot of it, not so much the fear, but but the the concern I had was that some of the other employees were concerned about what the impact would be. You know, and and um, e- even yeah. my boss. He said, "Well, if you want to do it, do it," sort of thing. But but I, I didn't feel particularly yeah. supported by it. But it but it just you know it was just a great win. And I guess you've got stories like that in terms of the work that you do as a company as as Milden. Could you just give listeners a flavour of? I mean, we mentioned at the beginning of the um, interview about the companies that you work for, like the NHS and Centrica. Could you give us an idea of how you actually go in and deliver? A program and, and can you give us some case studies of, of some successes that you've had please Toby? Yeah I, I always find this question a bit hard to answer because the thing is that all of our work that we do is very tailored and bespoke to clients. Um, having said that there are there are consistent themes that have now come out over the last five years that that you know that we, we do regularly. So one is um, coming up with a strategy for a business, so an EDI strategy. Um, We've developed a methodology which is based on going and getting data or insights from your employees and actually creating an EDI strategy based on that that data and evidence. That's kind of part one. What type of data would that be that you you would collate? Yeah, so we do do, um, surveys. So we've designed a survey um, that captures it's kind of broken down into four parts really, but part one is getting a snapshot of the diversity demographics in your organization. Um, Part two is quantifiable metrics of inclusion um, that we can kind of measure and benchmark. Part three is qualitative responses from staff about inclusion. So we can get some real rich insights into their experiences and how they're feeling. And then part four, which I think is my favorite bit, is what I call the um, return on effort part. And this is where we can use some metrics to measure um, uh, return on effort or return on investment. So things like we, my favorite question that I ask is something like, um, are, you cons- are you seriously thinking of leaving the business in the next six months because you don't feel respected or that you belong? And we then correlate that data with salary information and we put it through a calculator and we can get a cost of attrition. And I'll, just to give you an example, we I did it for a, a technology company that employs just shy of a thousand people. Um, and it was potentially costing them up to one and a half million pounds wow. of, of those employees who, who felt like they wanted to leave the business because they didn't feel respected or that they belong. Um, and we use those kinds of metrics to then help the senior leadership team put their business case together. Because if you're thinking of, of developing a uh, a program to retain your staff that's going to cost, I don't know, let's say £30,000 um, in the first year, but, you are, but you're potentially uh, preventing up to £1.5 million worth of um, you know, cost in terms of employee turnover, that, that, that does represent a good return on investment. Yeah, and I guess hand in hand with that one and a half million pounds is is the bit that goes before it, which is they're not throwing hundred. The employees aren't throwing a hundred percent in. Exactly. So yeah. So part of our algorithm that we've got is um, is kind of the the cost leading up to somebody leaving. Um, so you've got their their low product. You've got an employee's low productivity rates. You've got the amount of time that a manager is spending on re recruiting or backfilling mm. that person. Um, you've then got the individual leaving um, the business and then you've got the ramp up time afterwards. So you've got a new member of staff coming to join, takes them a a time to get up to speed, learn the ropes, 
learn the culture, get assimilated into the business. They're not, you know, it's very rare that somebody's going to just come into the business and hit the ground running. Yeah. Um, and it's, so it all adds up. So when you've got when you've got that data, I guess you pass that over to the the management, um, and you give yeah. them these numbers and that. What what's the, what what are the next steps? So once we've got the data, we basically put it in a nice fancy looking report. Um, but what we do is we then turn that report into a strategy. So we sit down with the client and we help them create their strategy to um, be more inclusive, uh, increase the diversity of their organisation. It all depends on the on the organisation yeah. Um, yeah. and what what challenges they're facing and the context in which they're working in. So, for example, if you if I'm working with a client that has very low staff turnover, doesn't do a lot of recruitment, there's no point in doing a lot of work around recruiting more diversity into your business because you're just not recruiting people into your into your team. So maybe the focus, therefore, should be more on the culture of the organization, making sure that people are performing at their best um, are th- are not thinking of leaving the organization and want to stick around. And what type, what types of examples can you give from people who feel that they aren't included? What what types of comment would they make? What's a, what's a popular comment, Toby? Popular comments relate to um, their relationship with their manager very often um, and the behavior of people around them. And uh, just to give you a flavor of some examples, so I worked with one organization, um, public-facing business. Um, I won't name names, obviously, because of confidentiality, but yeah. they, they dealt with the public. And uh, I remember speaking to one individual who worked in a particular branch of this business, um, and they faced uh, racist abuse from a customer. And they, their, their manager didn't support them at all in that. Oh. You know, they didn't have their back. They basically said, it's your problem. You need to get over it, essentially. Mm. <laughs> um, and that individual left that business because they didn't feel that their, the management had, had their back. Yeah. Um, they didn't you know, kick the customer out or anything like that. Um, another instance would be uh, I worked with one organization that had quite a big drinking culture as a way of celebrating and, and bonding as a team. But for actually quite a large number of people, um, because this business was based in a very multicultural city, that that was quite exclusionary on a number of different levels. Um, It was exclusionary for people that didn't drink because of religious reasons uh, or or health reasons. Um, Spoken to, you know, recovering alcoholics that find that kind of team networking or bonding very difficult. Um, or indeed people with caring and parenting responsibilities because very often it happened after work hours right. when yeah. people need to go home and pick their kids up from school or or look after an elderly relative um, after work. Um, so on a number of different levels, it didn't work for people. Yeah, I can, I can look at, I can understand the drinking one in, in as much as if they went after work to celebrate and as you say, they had these other responsibilities or they just didn't want to go, they would perhaps feel that they're not part of the team to the full extent the others are and, you know, it could, could affect their career prospect perhaps. Yeah, and, and and I don't know about you, but like when I've been out drinking with, team, you know, my teammates in the past, um, quite, a, you know, quite a lot of business still happens. You, you yes. have those kind of informal chats about a project yeah. or a client or we go, oh, have you heard about this opportunity opening up? I think you should put your name forward for that promotion or something like that. You know, business still happens. Mm. Um, and yeah, and and if you, if you can't participate in that, then you miss out on those opportunities potentially. It's interesting how times have changed, um, showing my age now, but I remember in the 1980s where I worked, it was the norm on a Friday lunchtime mm. for everybody to, from the sales office to go to the pub, probably have a little yeah. bit too much, um, come back at about <laughs> three o'clock or something. That doesn't happen as much now. It's much more a case of, you know, I know when I've been out, when I worked, you would, if you did go to the pub, it would be an orange juice or something, uh, or maybe half a beer at the most. Yeah. It's, it's ama- amazing how times have changed in that respect. It is. And, and norms change, cultures change. Um, you, you know, we're seeing different attitudes of people 
younger generations, you know, if we look at Gen Zs that are entering the workforce, they've got very different attitudes and expectations of work compared to older generations. Yes. And this is what's really interesting about multi-generational workforces. I think I wrote in my book, I think we've got like six generations now working in the same workplace because we've got Generation Z coming through um, and, uh, you know, and we've got people who are coming out of retirement and getting back into work yeah, because of the cost of living and things like that, or, ju- or just because they want to work, you know, mental stimulation, do yeah. something. Yeah. 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 Um, and the thing is, I think sometimes we fall into the trap of thinking that one generation is better than the other. Um, but that's the wrong way of looking at it. I think, I think because we've all got something to contribute, you know, we've got mm. older workers who have got a, a heap of experience um, they've been there, they've done that, they've got the t-shirt, they, you know, do you know what I mean? They, mm. They've made the mistakes that yes. that we can avoid. But then you've got the Gen Zs coming through who uh, they, they've grown up with technology. They, they don't know, they, you know, they don't know lo- what life is like without the internet. No. Or without a smartphone. Yeah. Um, and so they're bringing skills to the workplace as well. Yes. Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting mix, isn't it? You mentioned earlier, I mean, the first thing I would say is that you going into a company to to do this uh, quantitative and qualitative research that you do and get get all the data, and you gave me a couple of examples there of of um, somebody saying how they weren't supported by their manager um, when they were sort of racially racially abused. Um, it must be great for a company to actually get all that because the company itself, you know, they're they're busy doing what they. You come in, you take a snapshot of it. And you give it to them and, they, and they've yeah. got the answers. So, so like, I'm curious as to the next bit. So, for example, on, on that racist one, um, my simple mind would say to me, well, you go to the company and say, you need to train that manager and give him some training in, or her, yeah. in, in, into her, in terms of how they should deal with that type of thing. Is that the sort of thing you would do? Yeah, so part of, obviously, we would analyse the data, but part of that would be we we would be looking for big themes and patterns. So if there was a pattern of managers not supporting individuals who received, who were on the receiving end of racial abuse, for example, let's say that happened with, um, with a client, we would then go in and think about, well, what does that solution look like? Yeah. Um, it's hard to say in this instance what that solution might look like. As again, it's all depend. It's all contextual. Yeah. So it could be designing a training program, but equally, it could be um, uh, going in and looking at policies that the company has. Um, you know, is is a company's uh, anti? Does does the company even have an anti-racism policy or? Uh, discrimination or harassment policy so we look at multiple we look at things in multiple levels but what I mean once we've got the data and the insights we we formulate a strategy for the client um, that cl- that the strategy really is designed to get the client from where they are now to where they ideally want to be in the next three to five years um, and then we create the roadmap underneath that strategy because what I what I see happening a lot is is organizations come up with a lovely looking strategy and they quite often create a, a lovely glossy brochure to go along with that. Um, but then nothing happens. No action takes place. Mm. So I'm, I'm really quite strict about this. I'm like, okay, we'll come up with the strategy, but then we're going to have a very detailed roadmap that sits underneath that strategy. And that roadmap is going to tell us what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, who's going to do it, when it's going to be done by and how we know we're, we're doing it well. So I guess when you go in um, and you, you get all the data and you go back with the strategy and the roadmap, do you work with the client post execution of, of the strategy? Yeah, in a lot of cases we do. So mm. a lot of cases we, we, we will hold their hand while they're doing the implementation um, to, to guide them, to make sure that they, to, to hold them account, to make sure they are doing what they said they would do they they quite appreciate that accountability buddy uh a lot of the times they ask us to do some of the solutions so if there's training required they might ask us to develop and deliver the training ourselves 
yeah. um, or work with another partner to to do that. Do you have any any businesses where you are working with them sort of on an ongoing basis continually? Yeah, so we, we have an interesting mix of businesses or clients that we work with. I mean, since I've sat, set up the business five years ago, we've we've now gone over our 100th client oh, wow. um, over those five years, which is really good. Yeah. Um, I'd say uh, our clients tend to fall into a few buckets. So bucket one is we've got a small number of clients that we've worked with for a very long time and, we, and we're continuing to, to support. Um, another bucket of clients is clients where we've spent quite a lot of time with them to help them understand the employee experience and put the strategy together but now they feel quite confident in themselves to just go go you know go go alone go they've flown the nest so to speak um then we have quite a lot of clients that come in and use us as a bit of a catalyst so they they are at the beginning of their journey um there's they're they're still trying to figure things out and we'll go in and we'll just do like a one-off thing just to get the conversation going um, to act as a bit of catalyst for the organization so that more and more people in the business are talking about it. Yes. And then, and then they build on that momentum. Oh, okay. That sounds, sounds really interesting. One, one point I've got is I was talking to one of my um, uh, friends recently. I, I mentioned that we had this interview coming up and he works for an organization where they have inclusivity targets. And he felt um, although it, it wasn't himself, he felt that there were one or two managers that were employing people based on making sure they hit their targets. In other words, mm-hmm. you know, unkindly ticking the boxes, as opposed to getting the right person for the job. How how can that yeah. issue be dealt with? What what's your what are your thoughts on that, Toby? Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's something that comes up a lot. I mean, it's something I mentioned in my book actually that. Um, targets can sometimes drong the, drive the wrong behavior. Um, there are some clients that I work with that like targets. They, that it's just within their culture. They might be a particularly like a sales orientated business where it's quite normal to have targets or KPIs. There are other clients that I work with that are quite averse to having targets. Um, so I always say to them, it's, yeah, it's a personal choice. Um, but the point that I make is that, and I think this is coming out of that conversation that you had with your with your friend, is that targets can sometimes drive, drive the wrong behavior. Um, we always say within the field of diversity and inclusion that it's the, the best person should always get the job. You shouldn't get a job because you tick a particular characteristic. And that, that there's a couple of reasons for that. One is if it's positive discrimination, you're on iffy ground anyway, legally speaking. Um, it's not something that is endorsed in the UK. You can take positive action, but you can't really positively, you can't positively discriminate. I can't give you a job, Bob, because, you know, I've, you, you know, I want to have a man on the team and, yeah. you know, you're the only, you're the only male candidate that I've got. And like, I can't give you a job because, um, uh, you know, you tick a box. Um, you have to be the best pet candidate for the job. Um, I mean, within law, there are some exceptions. So, you know, for example, you can you can specify a gender. If if I'm if I'm running a um, uh, like a a women's um, domestic abuse refuge, for example, yeah. that I I you know I, I I might legally be able to say I want women working in in the refuge because of the the, the personal safety yes. or psychological safety of my my service users for instance Mm. so there are some instances um the other thing the other flip side to that is if 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 an individual finds out that they got the job because they ticked a particular box um it can lead to resentment um Mm. for themselves and their colleagues around them yeah which is not a healthy atmosphere to work in no, I, and I guess as part of your role with with or, or, or Mild and the company do is is they would educate people in, into what you just said there. Yeah, and we work with our clients to set the right target. So what we might do, rather than set a target of saying, okay, we let's for instance, we want to say our a particular department has got yeah at least thirty percent women working in the team, for example, we might scale it back and go actually let's look at the recruitment process 
yeah. to pick apart the recruitment process. And the data might tell us that actually we don't have many women applying for the role in yeah. the first instance. So if we don't have many women applying for a role, then we're not going to be able to offer them a job <laughs> if they get into an interview room. So what we'll do is we'll set a target for attracting more women into the top of the recruitment process. One of one of my other friends mentioned that he works in an industry which years ago would have attracted younger people to join it, but it doesn't anymore. Mm. The only people that he can get are people in the same industry who tend to be middle-aged and older. Um, but he wants mm. he wants younger people. Uh, they don't seem to be interested in that particular industry. So in your experience, what would be the way to attract younger people in, into positions in this industry? I suppose if I was in his shoes, I, I would want to get my hands on some insights to find out why younger people are not attracted to that industry. Um, maybe perceptions have changed, attitudes have changed. Um, so I, I, I mean, I, I would go out and run a focus group. Um, I would try and maybe get friendly with a local college and say, could I come and talk to some of your students for an hour um, about coming to work in my company or my industry and what their perceptions or expectations are, um, and then use that as a basis for thinking about what strategy I might have going forwards. Yes. Oh, well, that's that's useful. I'll, I'll pass that on to him, or hopefully he'll listen to this Please episode. do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other, the other thing I wanted to mention was the fact that you, you've, been do, you've had your company for five years, but you've been involved in similar work prior to that. And we, I mentioned at the beginning of the interview that EDI tends to be much more in, in our language now. Have you seen a general improvement in how things are being run by businesses? There, ha- there has been a shift and there are more and more businesses that are investing in EDI. It's part of their business strategy. Um, I was having a conversation with a client the other day, actually, who's a head of HR and she was saying that the EDI has been the biggest shift in her HR career um, compared to anything else. Yeah. And she's been working in HR for, for a while now. And more and more businesses are looking into EDI. Um, and I think the other shift that I've started to see is more and more businesses want to do it properly and strategically. Um there was a really interesting article in one of the, the big, you know, broadsheet newspapers a few months ago saying that um, companies are spending less on EDI, um, but they are doing these are the businesses that were doing were doing the 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 kind of the bit box ticking exercise type yes. activities, as I would call it. Yeah. However, there are a large number of companies that have actually doubled down and are increasing their expenditure on EDI, but they're, they're the ones that are doing more of the kind of strategic stuff, looking at the company culture, trying to get it really embedded into the DNA and the infrastructure of the company, which is music to my ears because yes. <laughs> that's been my message all along that EDI should not be a window dressing exercise or a box ticking exercise. If you do it well, it does help your business grow and prosper. Hence, like my the, my first book that I wrote a couple of years ago was called, called Inclusive Growth. And then I, I was very deliberate about calling it that because for me, it was about, I, I, was, I was trying to reposition EDI in the minds of senior business leaders that if they do this well, then it will help their business grow. And, and is there any sort of independent data to sort of qualify the fact that there, there is an improvement in a business if, if they adopt these practices? Yeah, I mean, most famously, McKinsey have written four reports now. Um, they're good reports. My only concern with them is that when I've talked to lots of businesses, they often say, oh, it, it, it's all well and good McKinsey saying this, a, a multi, you know, a global multi-billion pound consultancy company. But I just can't see how this applies to my business and the industry that I work in and the countries in which I'm based. So, I mean, the general consensus out there, but if you look at the reports of McKinsey and there's other reports, you know, Harvard University have done lots of research and published papers and things like that, that 
diversity is good for business. It's yeah. um, diverse businesses tend to be more profitable. Um, they're just better at making decisions. They're more innovative. They're more creative. Um, staff engagement increases. Staff retention reduces. There's a number of like hard benefits to it. Um, what I try to do with my clients is get them to translate that <laughs> locally for them. Yes. What, what does it actually mean for them uh, at, their, at their unique business and the environment in which they're working in? Um, yes. There's also um, my favorite book. If anyone is interested in the, I suppose, the science behind diversity, my favorite book is called The Difference. And it was written by uh, a guy called Scott Page, who is a academic uh, over in America. I, th- I can't remember what e- which uni, but it's it's something like Stanford or MIT or something like that. Yeah. But his book is probably one of the best books that I've read in terms of proving the the business case behind it. On a wider context, we're, we're talking about EDI in terms of our own, you know, the, in the work life. What about people in clubs, um, voluntary organisations that aren't, you know, not necessarily paid, and in our everyday lives and with our unconscious biases that we, we probably all have to some degree because it, it's how we're brought up, isn't it? And things are historic and, and yeah. all the rest of it. What... What have you learned in what you do um, and, and what advice would you give people? So you're right, EDI is not exclusive to the workplace. I and mean, we've talked a lot about the workplace, I suppose, because that is that is my area of focus. Yes. Um, but, you know, voluntary organisations need to consider it as well. Particularly, I think, voluntary organisations, uh, charities and things like that, you, you're going to be working with a very diverse end user base or customer base um you know think this thing about imagine that you're running a food bank and yeah. um a number of people could walk through your door um be that gender ethnicity um whether somebody is transgender um disability all sorts of people end up in food banks and um if you are a volunteer in a food bank then how you interact with your service users can can have a real impact on on their day. Um, yes. On a personal level, I, I mean, I've learned a lot. Um, funny, like you mentioned, bias. Um, when I was at the BBC, I, I I was I was in receipt of unconscious bias training, and um, I found out that I was mildly biased against disabled people, oh, yeah. um, which was surprising and shocking because. I was born with my disability and my brother's got the same condition as me. And I went to school with loads of disabled kids and I've worked with loads of disabled adults and I've got lots of disabled friends in my life. So you could, I, I've got my fair share of disability in my life. Yes. Um, and I didn't understand unconscious bias at the time. And I, I blamed myself. I thought it was something that was wrong with me, that I was ableist um, or discriminatory. Um and um, and then I, when I started researching it, you know, I realised that it's just the way that our brains are wired. In some instances, we're wired yeah. for bias. Um, it helps us in some situations, and it, it hinders hinders us in others. And I suppose as a manager, we need to have the wisdom of knowing when it's helping or hindering us. But it's also hugely influenced by the culture and the society that we that we grow up in, the experiences that we have. And I, I was I grew up in the eighties and nineties watching, you know, children's T V program and things like that. And there were very few disabled role models in the media. Um, disabled people were often portrayed as villains, victims, or heroes. But most James Bond villains have a disability <laughs> of some form of disfigurement. Um and um those were the messages that I was receiving that then end up as this secret silent script in the back of my brain that then influences how I interact with other disabled people. Yeah, I think I think what you're saying there is it's useful to actually understand yourself um, and understand it's quite normal to have unconscious bias, but just recognise it and, and um, yeah. do something about it. I we guess. all have it. Yeah. If you're yeah. alive and kicking, if you're hearing to this conversation right now, um, you have unconscious bias. 
yeah. it's part of the human condition. It's something that we we all have. And and like I said, like my favorite quote from a book um, was that our, our biases are just shortcuts in the brain. Um, they're neither good nor bad. They may help us in some situations and they may hinder us in others. Yes. Tell us about your latest book, Toby. Yes, yeah, so the latest book is called Building Inclusivity. Um, and it's much more of a practical how-to book because the first book that I wrote was more like the seven principles of what good looks like or the best practices. And everyone read it and said, oh, it's a really great book, easy to read. But like, what do I do now? <laughs> yeah. How do I actually do this in my business? I was like, oh, yeah, it's a good point. I forgot to mention that. Um, so that's when I wrote the second book, which is much more of a practical guide. Um, and it's based on this framework that I've developed over the last five years, which I've called the um, Building Inclusivity uh, Flywheel. And they are basically the, the, the practical steps that you need to take to, to implement EDI into your business. And how's the podcast going? The podcast is going really well. Um, we, I think I'm over 100 episodes now. And the, my, my podcast is a bit like yours. I, 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 I sit down and interview experts. It's not me rambling on. Um, this is quite odd for me because it's not me usually doing the rambling on. <laughs> it's, uh, it's um, yeah, I, I sit down with experts in their field. Um, yeah. They could be an EDI expert. They could be a business leader who has made some real um impact in terms of diversity and inclusion and i mean excuse the pun but we have a a, a very diverse range of topics yes uh, could be one week we could be talking about supporting people experiencing menopause in the workplace um, another time we could be talking about somebody how you support staff experiencing domestic abuse um Another time we could be talking about how you make your website accessible for disabled customers. So um, there's a whole bunch of topics on there. Yeah. Well, we'll put the link in the show notes on on that, Toby. Thank you. And where can listeners find out more about the work of Milden? Uh, there's two good places. I mean, if you just go to my website, which is milden.co.uk, um, you can read about what we do. There's a whole page on the resources page where you can get access to the podcast and the books and the report I, I write I write reports and then we just upload them to the website. You can download them for free. You don't even need to give us your email address. It's just com- you know completely publicly available. Uh, also LinkedIn as well. Yeah, follow me on LinkedIn and connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you've got a question, just you know fire me a message. Mm. I must say your your website is very very comprehensive. And you mentioned there about some of the um, articles and reports that you've got. There's a, there's a huge volume of um, stuff to for people to read on that yeah i like to make stuff publicly available because you know i'm here and my business is here to to really make a difference um yeah i i want people to be able to 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 do their best work regardless of what your background and and circumstances are yes and yeah. we yeah i mean yes we obviously we've got paying clients but we also provide a lot of material through reports and things like that I've got one last question, Toby. Um, if we've got any listeners that are interested in pursuing a career in, in equity, diversity and inclusion, and if we've got any HR managers or companies who want to find out more about the work you'd do, what advice would you give? So for anyone who, was, who wants to get into the career, I would say if you are lucky enough to work in an organization with an employee resource group or a staff network. So a lot of big businesses, they'll have, um, you know, they'll have like an LGBT network or a disability network or a, a gender network or a, you know, that kind of thing. Get involved in those networks. Even if you don't personally identify with that particular characteristic, just get involved in the, the network's business. That's a good way in. Um, if you feel like your business should be doing something around diversity and inclusion, but it isn't, and you don't have a staff network, then put your case forward to the management team. See if they will create a role for you, even if it's like part-time. They might go, because they might be a bit hesitant to begin with. They might go, oh, and even if you could do it like one day a week, um, that's a good start. And then you can just build from there, but like put the business case forward to, to create 
the role um, if it doesn't exist already. Mm. Uh, and also just go out and put yourself through training and learning. I mean, there's lots of courses out there. Um, just Google diversity inclusion training. Um, so I um, I might be a bit biased in saying this, but um, uh, a friend of mine set up a company at the same time as my business called DNI Leaders. Um, and he's got loads of information on his website, and, but he basically runs loads of webinars every month for free. Um, he organizes loads of courses. So going going to like the DNI Leaders website is like a really great place to start. Um, well, we'll put if that's okay, we'll put a, a great, link. It's a great yeah. hub. We'll put a link on the show notes to that as well. Then, if that's okay. Yeah, I, I'm sure Mark would appreciate that. But it's it's a nice community of people yeah. who work in DNI. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of DNI communities out there that are basically. Um, I'm going to shoot myself in the foot now, but they're, they're you know they're, they're they're diversity consultants that are trying to get business. Mm. Um, Mark has built up a lovely community because they are all um, you know DNI practitioners working in businesses there to support one another. Yeah. There's you know there's no pitching or sales or anything like that going on. No, no. Well, Toby, this has been a really fascinating conversation. It's been interesting to learn more about the work you do and understand the positive difference that EDI can do. My guest today has been Toby Milden. Toby is an equity, diversity and inclusion architect, founder of the Milden Consultancy and author of the book, Building Inclusivity, Making Your Workplace Equitable, Diverse and Inclusive. You can find links to Toby's work and the book in the show notes. Thank you for coming on the show, Toby. You're welcome. Thanks, Bob. listening to undercurrent stories i hope you've enjoyed this episode please feel free to share the show link to your friends and family and if you have 60 seconds i will be most grateful if you would please rate and review to hear more episodes please subscribe to the show and visit undercurrentstories.com if you leave your email in the link we will notify you as soon as new episodes are released also check out our social media links details of which can be found on the show notes Until next time, this is Bob Wells wishing you all the very best.